Welcome, 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 and uh, my name is Susan Spiegel, and I'm a Toronto-based architect, president of the Ontario Association of Architects, the regulatory body for the architecture profession in Ontario. Um, the OEA exists to protect the public interest, and we always have to say that because architects don't understand that. We're not here to protect architects, we're here to pre protect the architectural um, what am I saying? We're, we're here to regulate um, the profession and protect public interest, which is very different from protecting architects. So we always like to repeat that every time we talk about the OAA. And also, we have another object, which is to educate um, the public about architecture. So this is part of what this is about, and I'm very excited that everybody's here today. Um, to begin this night's event, I would very much like to acknowledge the land on which our headquarters are built and uh, where we are gathered today. And I'm hoping, oh now you can hear me, sorry. Um, I hope that everybody will um, join me in this moment of reflection. For millennia, it has been the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, the credit of the credit, as well as the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. We honor, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. We honor the rich cultural and natural landscape our buildings and spaces are part of, and the connection to the land Indigenous peoples have valued for time immemorial. We are grateful for Indigenous knowledge that guides us and commits to building in harmony with the land in creating sustainable spaces for generations to come. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge <clears throat> our responsibility to address past and present injustices and provide space for traditional knowledge and worldviews to shape the architectural landscape of Turtle Island. So I'm um, so pleased to be joining you all for the reinstatement of the NOW lecture series. And as I said, it's a packed house, which is really exciting. And it's wonderful to see everybody's beautiful faces. And so we'll have to plan more events like this in the future. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to um, the OEA staff who put this event together for us and to all the council members and volunteers who give their time to ensure we get the benefit from fantastic pro programming like this. Um, and by the way, if you're interested in being involved in shaping our profession, we're actually in the midst of OEA council election season right now. So please consider putting your name into the ring. It's an exciting time to join. We're just wrapping up our first uh, year under the new five-year strategic plan. And important key themes of every decision we make are climate action and equity, diversity, and inclusion, including reconciliation. And that will be shaping the activities for years to come. You can expect some very meaningful activities in the future. So now to our now lecture. Um, it offers a chance to hear tonight, we're going to hear firsthand from oh, the OEA's biennial Best Emerging Practice Award winners. And um, this award honors young firms who demonstrate a clear vision, have, well, have well-articulated goals, and have developed effective strategies that provide them with a competitive advantage. And I see them all nodding their heads over here. <laughs> Tonight, we are happily joined by both the 220 and the 222 winners, Office U and Smart Density. Um, I wish I had been on the jury for Office U. I would also have voted for them. And I was on the jury, I admit, for Smart Density. And I'm very delighted that we're going to get to hear both of you tonight. Um, and um, we will be engaging in a moderated discussion on what um, to consider when you're starting your own practice, which is, I think, really exciting because really, um, people who are starting their practices and emerging architects, really, they're the lifeblood of this profession. And we really uh, want to hear from you and, um, you know, and, and understand what, what, what tidal wave is coming forward to, um, to really inform a new architectural profession. So we're very excited about that. So leading tonight's um, discussion is OAA VP Communications, Jennifer King. And Jen is an OAA counselor and chairs the Association's Communications Committee. She's a licensed technologist OAA with the Thunder Bay-based architectural and interior design firm called Approach Design. So please went, welcome Jennifer King. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Susan. 
I'm excited to be here to, to uh, talk with some incredibly talented individuals. Uh, the format for tonight's uh, includes presentations from each practice, followed by a discussion. We will reserve time at the end for any additional questions, so please hold your questions and comments until the end. Um, first, the 2020 winners of the OA's Best Emerging Practice Award are, are Office U. Office U is an architectural landscape design office centered around the values of collaboration, social impact, and environmentally sustainability, with projects in Ontario, Asia, and Europe. Joining us tonight from Office U are Eurus, Sebastian, and Nicholas. Next, the 2022 winners of the Best Emerging Practice Award are Smart Density. Namo and Misha are uh, founded Smart Density in 2016 with a strong and simple vision to create more density where needed while improving the urban environment. Active across the GTA, they are making significant headway in changing the urban environment through their urban design and advocacy eff efforts. Joining us tonight from Smart Density are Nama and Misha. Uh, let's now hear from Office U. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having um, having us here today, and a very delayed uh, thank you to the OAA for the honor of this award. Um, I also want to um, send a big thank you to everybody um, who has helped us along the way in our office, um, Oliver Green, um, Anastasia Jaffray, uh, Gia Liu, uh, Julia Nakanishi, Jim Shi, uh, Sophia Sagala, uh, and also the many other people from other offices, consultants, builders, friends, and family members. Um, and also thank you to Heather Doubledom, who has uh, provided a lot of good advice to us. Um, I'm also really glad that after two years of pandemic, we are still operating as an office, otherwise this would be awkward. Um, so having to write this presentation has been um, actually very helpful for us uh, in pushing us to define ourselves as a practice. And as a result, our talk today is, is probably not really gonna be a straightforward overview of our work to date. Um, instead, we want to provide a discussion um, of our experiences, our questions, and our doubts concerning architectural practice, and talk a little bit about how all of that has informed our methodology and our direction as an office so far. Um, so when we launched Office U in 2016, we really didn't have very much experience working together. Um, Euros and I had gone to school together at uh, University of Waterloo, and um, Euros and Nico had been working together at a large Toronto firm, um, mostly on condominium projects. Um, but we'd all been spending more and more of our evenings um, mostly complaining about our jobs, but also sometimes discussing design methodology and urbanism. Um, we had a good idea of what we liked and what we didn't, and we also had some rough ideas of a conceptual framework and a design for designing buildings. Um, we naturally wanted to put these ideas to the test, um, and we began entering some competitions like long before we had any idea that we wanted to be an office. Oh, sorry, this is my heading. Uh, one of the first, uh, which is this very dramatic floating theater on the River Spree in Berlin, um, this project was a lot of fun, and it shows the, some of the Office U identity in very early form. Um, and we also entered this uh, ideas competition for a concert hall in Tokyo. Um, so at the time, we really didn't know very well how to work together, so this project is never properly completed. But we still really like it because it helped us develop some of our core ideas, that of an architecture acting as a framework for life, um, and activity, something that would be filled in over time and would host some of the vitality of the neighborhood that it was hosted in. So we kept going with competitions, um, and a lot of this was really out of necessity. Uh, as I'm sure many of you in this office, in this building know, um, every public project here in Ontario requires going through an RFP process that effectively filters out a lot of offices that don't already have a ton of experience. And without much of a name or pre-existing client base, we had very limited prospects with private practice. So our strategy has been to look for competitions that were first of all completely anonymous, and second, they were evaluated based on the design itself rather than prior experience or other qualifications. 
Um, and as a result, we ended up doing quite a few international competitions um, all over the world. Primarily, we did a lot in South Korea, uh, China, Central Europe. Um, and uh, much to our surprise, the competitions were actually a viable business model, which we never would have imagined. Um, so far, they've been, you know, we've been very fortunate that they've been able to support our office. Um, and they've also given us a lot of really great experiences and memories, being able to travel to many places and meet different people, get to know the, the kind of cultures of all of these places that we're going to. Um, but at the same time, we have started feeling after all of these projects that the way that architecture is designed in this globalized system of competitions is in many ways a very strange way of working. A um, Couple points here, first of all is that we are asked to design buildings and landscapes for places that we know very little about, for communities that we really rarely get to meet. We have very little information and this leads to constantly second guessing our ideas, unsure of what the client or jury's actual expectations or priorities are. Um, and we're always worrying that a certain architectural form or a tree that we chose might have the wrong connotations to a certain person. It is a real concern when you're dealing in very different uh, culture is where everything you do is symbolically charged. Um, the second thing is that since competitions always have us jumping from one building type to another, we have to start each one from zero with very little accumulated knowledge or experience. And given that architects are supposed to be experts on the built environment, the feeling of being an imposter is a really strong one, at least for me. Um, and when you start to see them actually get built, it makes me even more anxious, although I think that's universal. Um, the third is when we're engaged in a competition, there's always this nagging feeling that we haven't quite graduated from school. And there is a reason for that. It's, we, we've often noted how our schooling at schools of architecture doesn't actually train us for normal practice where you have you know, real clients who you have to be responsible to. It trains us for competitions. Um, we develop a vision in relative isolation. We make drawings and renderings and models that we hope are convincing. And then we present them to a jury of our peers. And that's follow following a structure that was really formalized during the Beaux-Arts period and has really pr primarily was designed for palaces for kings on mountaintops. Uh, the fourth point is, and forgive me if this sounds a little bit cynical, but after you've done a certain number of competitions and it's really hard not to see this endless churn of proposals as anything other than a marketplace of forms that get shopped around the entire world until they stick somewhere for often very opaque reasons. Under globalization and the internet's economy of free-floating images, I feel particularly that architecture projects have become more and more commoditized and the level of engagement of our profession has become increasingly shallow. So as a result of all of this uncertainty and our very real distant, distance from the stakeholders of all of our projects, we've been forced to clarify a lot of our own ideas. Um, you know, there's no client to pat you on the back and tell you what a great job you're, you're doing, how, how much they like your, your ideas. You have to be very self-critical. Every competition entry, in addition to answering the specific project brief, becomes a kind of mini thesis about what you believe in. Um, and so we spent a lot of time and energy asking ourselves, fundamentally, what do we think is a good architecture project? And what are the architectural and human values that are actually embedded in this competitive, globalized process of making cities and buildings? Yours might have the answer. I definitely don't have the answer, uh, but it was great. Wasn't he great? <laughs> uh, anyways. Uh, so I'm going to start with this question, what is good? So um, usually, as architects, um, what I find in our experience, when push comes to shove, we decide to make our forms clean, our uh, organization coherent, and what's the last one? Like our aesthetics uh, clear. Uh, and these are all great things. Like, I mean, these are obviously better to be uh, clean than messy or, you know, confusing. But also, uh, if you think about your everyday life, they're probably not the most important things. If you were to find yourself on a romantic date and it went really well, you probably wouldn't describe the other person as being clean, clear, and coherent. <laughs> you would probably say something like, uh, 
They were kind, generous, empathetic. Uh, so there seems to be this kind of uh, a gap between things we really value in our life and things we really value as architects. Um, and the question is, you know, how can we, like, how to interpret this gap? So um, I think one way to do it is to use this, uh, these philosophical terms, um, idealism and materialism. What's really great about philosophy is that words don't mean what you think they mean. <laughs> so um, idealism basically means it's a belief in a transcendental realm, that there is something kind of a perfect world of ideas above our own, uh, and that uh, in this view, the value of something is derived from how well it's aligned to this transcendental perfection. Uh, materialism doesn't mean uh, craving for um, material things. It just it means that it's a belief that there is nothing beyond, nothing beyond our material encounters. And in the materialist view, a, a value of something is derived only from the quality of the encounters that we actually have. So um, when you think about this a bit, you can see how there's two different ways to kind of interpret almost everything we do in our practice as architects. For example, uh, from idealist view, uh, buildings are three-dimensional objects. They exist outside of time, so they can be drawn, uh, they can be built and completed, uh, and the value of them is like is a property of the object. Whereas uh, in the materialist view, buildings are really a kind of four-dimensional processes that are tied to a place. They kind of, uh, they have a life of their own. They are never really complete. They just evolve and change over time. Even after they're built, you know, people can make additions and uh, transform over time. And the value of them is derived from the property of them as a process. Uh, in the idealist view, like I kind of mentioned, like a process is secondary to the object. So process serves to create this ideal perfect object. It's kind of like, as architects you know, we are willing to really sacrifice a lot uh, of our life to make it as perfect as possible. You know, working all night, enduring sometimes work conditions that are not really okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the materialist view, there is really no distinction between the process of making a building and the building itself. It's all kind of a, a series of encounters. Now, in the idealist view, architects are authors of buildings. We are the creators. Whereas in the materialist view, we just facilitate the process. We make sure it goes on. Uh, in the idealist view, drawings represent these buildings. Whereas, um, and the drawings are good if they depict as perfect building as possible. Whereas in the materialist view, what makes a drawing good is how it moves the process forward, right? Like if a, if a, if a drawing really engages a client or other people and makes the process move, go ahead. And I think finally, from idealist view of architecture, vernacular buildings are only interpreted through the values of architecture as such, right? Like uh, if a vernacular is seen as good, it's interpreted to the ideals. Whereas in the materialist view, like it's vernacular is often better than professional architecture. Okay. So, um, I mean, our profession really derives from this tradition Sebastian mentioned, which is like, uh, it was really created for palaces and churches where there was an uh, understanding that these buildings represent some kind of transcendence. But uh, in our world, like today, if architecture is supposed to be meaningful for everyday things, we are beginning to question that. We are beginning to wonder if there is a different way of actually approaching this. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so not sure where that gets us, but from our point of view, um, what we're aiming to, to, to try to get to here is 
what is good or what is at least better for us. Um, and for us, um, it's to let go a bit of that idealist uh, architectural baggage. Um, and the way to do this for us is for architecture to, to learn from landscape. Um, what, one thing landscape does really well is to, to see space holistically and temporarily. Um, it's central to the profession, and um, this is what kind of drives us to, to, to want to think architecture through landscape. And which one goes in the right direction? There we go. <laughs> so we all have slightly different um, backgrounds in the office. Um, I trained and practiced as a landscape architect prior to Office U. And every project um, was a physical layering of geology, hydrology, uh, fauna, flora, but also a temporal layering of, of long-term phasing, short-term scheduling, and growth and evolution. Um, and that's, that's something that really embodies what, what Euros mentioned, uh, projects that, uh, that are both products of, uh, of current encounters, of the site as it is, um, and, but also spaces for future encounters. Um, and in order to represent these kind of projects, um, these layers um, are often uh, mapped um, and, 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 and documented through, through different types of representation. And that's one thing that, that, uh, that landscape offices do, do quite well. Um, as James Corner said it better than I could ever say, uh, mapping unfolds potential. Um, so in itself, it's an act of design. Um, and landscape offices really often develop their own representational methods to help process and interpret the complexity of a site. So Ian McCarg had his famous layered drawings where um, he, uh, he uh, identified areas of opportunities through the overlap of different layers. But even before the uh, advent of contemporary landscape architecture as a practice, um, uh, these types of landscape processes were uh, being depicted through various types of, uh, of narrative mappings that, that really layered physical and temporal elements. Uh, this one's one that, that we like quite a lot. It's from the Très Riche Heures du Duc de Berry, which is from the 1400s, so pretty old. And they were already trying to, to, to represent not only narratives, but, but also social activity and different types of, uh, of, of, of landscapes, temporality. Everything was, was coming together. Um, but beyond uh, having a longer tradition of mapping the complexity of sites, uh, in most cases, landscape projects also have a clear vernacular chain of influence. And by that I mean uh, a, a chain where local landscapes or nature is seen as, as creating or engineering culture which then paves the way for the built environment. And of course, to complicate all of this, each of these elements in the chain is always in flux and has feedbacks that, that, that lead back to another. And this is where um, notions like sustainability come in, where, where the feedbacks start to, to, to affect relationships between these dif dis different uh, links in the chain. So what we really wanted um, as an office was to create a framework that's both methodical um, to help deal with some of that complexity, but also resilient enough um, to adapt to, to, to changes um, at any point in that chain of influence. And so, so to help us think uh, architecture through landscape, um, and among other exercises, we started working through um, a design matrix. And that for us was an analytical tool for mapping relationships across the site. Um, it also for us a design tool um, to include more stakeholders uh, and more complex relationships in a project. So it includes factors like flora, fauna, all of the ones that I can mentioned before. Um, and this matrix is, is a guide uh, towards creating um, flexible design interventions that can fluidly change over time and as, as, of course, as the layers of the matrix do and as ecosystems and societies do. So as Sebastian mentioned um, earlier, um, in early 2016, we had worked on a couple of competitions together. Um, didn't work out so well, but that's the way it goes. Um, and most, um, I think we're attributing a lot of that um, to the fact that we were really lacking a framework for our projects. Um, and so we ran into this open and anonymous competition for a new National Museum complex of South Korea, which seemed extremely daunting. Um, and I mean, <laughs> At first, we were thinking we weren't actually going to do it, but uh, then we kind of like thought through it, and we realized that 
the site was really complex. It had not only it was the, the meeting place of uh, many different landscapes, but it was also the meeting place of many different facets of Korean culture, which would each cater to, to a different set of stakeholders. So this is really where the idea of, uh, of the organizing matrix uh, came together. And we needed um, a way to organize um, everything into a coherent and respectful project. And it allowed us to, to, to connect um, each museum in the master plan to a specific character based on a stack of properties, many of them already present on the site and documented through the matrix. And so uh, what we did for this project is that we spent a good deal of our allotted uh, design time designing not a project, as is the way we work, uh, but diagrams and tables and doing research on, about on-site diversity and change and inclusion. And in the end, um, we organized it all into the matrix that, that kind of like brought together the landscape and the ecology and the program to help us uh, come up with a design. And the design we submitted didn't really feel like a typical design that we would have done beforehand. It, was, it felt in the end more like a vessel um, that would support and amplify uh, the beauty and the diversity of the existing local landscapes. And we weren't really inventing anything new in this case. Um, we were just working with what was there. So against all odds, we ended up winning the project. Um, and I think we realized that a lot of that was because of our, the design process we had used. Um, so we, we kept experimenting with the content of the matrix, uh, again for a winning proposal for Skola Smichov in Prague. But this time, um, the input of Sofia and Oliver, who had recently just joined the office, um, led to a different way of interpreting the matrix. It was, it was no longer just a way of bringing buildings and ecologies together, but also included more social layers. Um, and uh, the matrix really, um, <laughs> so the matrix uh, really allowed us to, to, to gather the input of other stakeholders into the project and stakeholder groups that were involved during the project but also after the project, after our initial design was completed. And so the result was a design that uh, promoted both environmental and social stewardship in the students uh, by enabling them to collectively take ownership of, uh, of their spaces. Um, and, and the building in the end was more of a type of, uh, of scaffolding, of, of fixed and flexible spaces, each functioning on different scales and whose change uh, in use would impact the relationship between the building and the city at large. And so for us, the, the, the matrix is, is a simplification of more, of more thorough mapping, analysis and, and en engagement. Uh, but in a way, it's, it's an expression of, of our design process and our desire to be inclusive um, or kind to all the, the layers of a site. And so it changes and it evolves um, from project to project and it becomes a storytelling device um, to help convey the, the, the diverse and often complex relationships that, that take place in a project. So our, our difficult task as architects then becomes translating this matrix into inhabitable spaces or, or usable spaces. And, and for us, every time the outcome of this translation exercise is a bit different. Um, here's uh, here is for a museum project that we uh, rec recently shortlisted it for, um, and in which the storytelling and uh, the preservation of local traditions um, goes um, hand in hand with habitat restoration. So all of these elements were kind of uh, brought onto the matrix uh, for that, and kind of they kept changing, and they will keep changing. Um, and here um, we had used it for, for another project for a geological park uh, and education center project on Jeju Island uh, where the matrix uh, took a different form and uh, one in which local stories of um, the local harvest, the women that uh, risk their lives fishing for octopus off the coast, um, of forest spirits, um, really drove uh, the, the design uh, of the project. So f for us, uh, all in all, I think, I think what, what we're trying to get at is that we've really struggled with the fear that architecture, um, often with a focus on iconic buildings and perhaps sometimes a lack of site specificity, 
was no longer as effective um, at conveying simple human values um, and fostering them, of course, like yours mentioned. Um, and this fear was compounded when we started the working with the, the competition process by the, by the fact that we realized that architects are rarely members of the communities that, uh, that their work impacts. Um, and if nothing else, uh, from that point of view, the, the, the matrix is one of our responses or, or perhaps one of the coping mechani mechanism uh, to one of these fears. Um, and it keeps us in touch uh, with the places um, and communities that our work impacts. Um, so, from maybe a more philosophical point of view, it, it, it helps us withdraw um, ourselves as architects in favor of becoming facilitators, um, or maybe perhaps uh, more materialist architects. Um, so, so, that allows us to, to, to create work that uh, prioritizes the relationships between communities and places. And of course, uh, our thinking of architecture through landscape is a work in progress. And um, for now, all we can do, I think, is, is hope that it keeps our work rooted in um, simple values like kindness and generosity and empathy. And yeah, speaking of empathy, I think I'm going to leave it at this and <laughs> let you guys enjoy the next presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, so I would like to thank you for coming in tonight. Um, I don't take it for granted. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, so let's get started. Um, we put a lot of thought into today's, uh, tonight's presentation and when we attended the last OEA now uh, in 2018, we were young architects and frankly, I went there because I wanted to see what it was so great about that company that they were awarded this prestigious recognition. And I was hoping that they will take us through, you know, to behind the scenes of running an architecture firm and starting an, your own architecture firm. And um, it wasn't about that at all. Uh, and um, so we decided to dedicate tonight's presentation to, to cover this side of, you know, being an architect. Uh, so we have 20 minutes to reveal all of our secrets to you, so let's get started. Uh, Misha and I, um, yeah, you can the, scroll down, it's okay. Um, Misha and I, if we do that, does it work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Misha and I, our professional story intertwined with our personal story. We met almost 15 years ago when I started architecture school. Um, it was, uh, and then we, we went, we traveled a lot. Uh, we went to student exchange. Uh, and uh, in 2014, we got married and, and moved to Canada to see if we like it here, and we liked it a lot. Uh, so we decided to stay. We worked for really great firms, got a license in architecture. I also became an urban planner. And in 2017, we opened Smart Density. And it took us, and that is something that we're gonna talk about, it took us a little while. We worked really hard until we got our first uh, building that uh, today, I think, uh, we submitted the permits for the second time. Um, and in uh, 2022, the Best Emerging Practice Award, which uh, I'm very grateful and honor. So, uh, 10 lessons we learned in five years of running an architectural practice. Okay, so we think the first question to ask is uh, <laughs> uh, what you can bring to the world. And uh, it's not something that has necessarily a quick and obvious answer, but it's definitely something to look into. Because, and the reason it's important because that's kind of a compass that can guide uh, anyone who starts about what kind of projects you need to look for, who you should talk to, um, what events you should um, attend. And for us, it's, um, it's kind of ca it's narrowed down to uh, creating uh, great urban environments through uh, intensification, and that's also in the name of our uh, company. I am, and we think in general there are like it has three like uh, finding what you can bring to the world ha comes to like has three components. So it has to be something you're passionate about. So it's something that's the kind of thing you care about, what you want to change in the world. Uh, it should be something you're interested in because. It's something you're going to do on like 
that you can work on a, on an everyday basis for uh, for years, and it should be something you can be good at. Um, and uh, for us, so we were always interested in uh, making these great urban uh, environments, and um, because we think it's uh, it's important for. Uh, human well-being and it addresses many of today's important uh, challenges from uh, housing affordability uh, to environmental degradation and uh, public health. Uh, but it's also, we were cared about other things as well, but uh, this was also something we were very, we were interested in uh, in the technical aspect of it, uh, of solving these issues and working on them every day. Uh, for many years, uh, and we also worked on it, so we knew it's something we can be good at. So that's how we came to this uh, field, and uh, that's how we encourage you to uh, look for uh, yours. You will see that in this presentation, we're not talking about our architecture at all. There's no really great images of you know the windows and how we look at a tree and the tree looks back at us that it does not exist in this presentation. What we did do is, uh, and, and the reason was that we really wanted to uh, make it about you. And uh, that leads me to lesson number two, is to develop that problem-solving mindset. Architecture school does it very, very well. Uh, but as a business owner, I, we are here to solve problems, solve problems to our clients, to the city, to the public, to any key player in this equation that's called architecture. And I can tell you, I can share with you that, okay, day one, we don't have clients, we don't have work, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, okay, I better do something to generate, um, uh, it's, uh, I can, uh, I can, oh, you it's can. the third one, yeah. So what, and we said, okay, how can I do that? How can I create some, a little bit of buzz, brand awareness? And uh, we decided that uh, it, I, I wanted to thought about something that is a huge pain point for our potential clients, and that is the adversarial discussion that y developers have with members of the public on almost every development application. And a lot of the time is because the public is not informed enough, you, you mentioned education, is not in, informed enough of what is the policy, what you know the municipal and, and, and uh, provincial policies are. And uh, we decided to come up with this game, and the game was a tool for us to, uh, um, it's a game, you collect uses, you build a little urban block, and it was a tool for us to, um, to to have an introduction meetings and then developers heard of it and called us and said, I heard that you have this community engagement tool. So that was just one example of how you, you I, it's all about identifying the problem and how you can help and be a problem solver for your clients. And yeah, it's still me. Uh, <laughs> um, and then the, th the third one is, is find your secret sauce. And I think that is something that architects are, frankly, struggle with. Uh, and uh, for us, it has been, for example, uh, the, uh, being uh, an urban planning and uh, an architecture firm. And I heard that the OIA almost did not award us uh, this, the best emerging practice because of the question of urban planning. So I just want to take advantage of this uh, very prestigious stage to say that being an urban planner made, be, made me a better architect. It's as simple as that. Understanding policy and the way policy informs buildings and what can be built is a very crucial uh, side of being an architect. And uh, for us, having this uh, urban planning aspect of, of the firm and offering a better service to our client has been our secret sauce. And just as, a, as an idea, you know, it's something that you need to ask yourself what you do better than anyone else. And if anyone else could say the exact same, any other architect, random architect, could say the exact same thing as you do, it's, it's not your secret sauce. So anything that is just good service, good design, attention to detail, these are not example for your secret sauce because any, potentially any, any other architect could say that. So what do you do better than anyone else that you can prove easily that you do that better than anyone else and anyone else could not say the same thing? Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, not just in architecture, but in any business probably, you need to learn to say no. And that's because your uh, energy and resources are limited. And it has uh, many implications. So you need to say no to working for free or for working for unsustainable fees because uh, it can generate a lot of being busy, but it doesn't really help promote a business. And also your work is often perceived as cheap in that way. Uh, when you're on a project, you need to be able to say no to like unreasonable requests for clients from the city, from um, other consultants. But the most important is to, uh, to be able to say no to projects that uh, don't uh, align with what you need to do and don't move you forward. And that's extra important because a project is a, often a very long-term commitment and you really don't want to be stuck on something that's not going to be, uh, uh, that you won't like uh, doing and that won't be helping you. Um, and um, um, part of it is like uh, there is this um, notion that, uh, if, for example, if you want, if your kind of uh, desire is to eventually do uh, apartment buildings, the way to get there is that you start with kitchen renovations and then you move to full house renovations and then you move to house additions and then you move to a new houses and then you maybe move to a row of townhouses and somehow, you know, you get there eventually. Uh, and I mean, by all means, if it's if you need to money to sustain yourself, you need to consider that. But uh, these types of uh, projects that don't really align with what you are looking to do are are wasting uh, wasting uh, resources and uh, energy. They don't build the expertise or the connections that will get you to the types uh, of other works uh, work you want to do. And so for our firm, we, for example, we, uh, we kind of been approached many times, uh, including in relatively early phases, uh, to do uh, houses. And houses is something we don't do in part because we don't believe that uh, we should have houses in kind of centrally uh, located, well-connected areas, which is where we do most of our work. Uh, but also because it's something that wouldn't really uh, move us forward. It's not, it won't develop the kind of expertise that uh, we need for the projects we want to do. Uh, it won't develop the connections. Uh, and uh, it will uh, require us to learn from uh, scratch uh, something that we won't want to repeat. Uh, oh, okay, we're already there. Uh, so on the other hand, not on the other hand, but kind of related to that is that uh, there is no uh, small acting part. Uh, so while we, we don't want to do uh, projects that are not aligned to what we do want to do, even if they're large, we do want to find uh, pieces of uh, the type of uh, areas we want to work in even if they are uh, small, because that is something that can move us forward. So for us, for example, uh, that was the reason we really um, uh, looked into offering feasibility studies as a, a standalone uh, offering, because that's something that allowed us to work on the types of larger development projects that we we're looking for, even if it's in a smaller scope than we uh, would uh, might do uh, today. And it helped us build the uh, connections, expertise um, uh, to, uh, to do that. So I encourage you to look more into like smaller roles in what's related to what you do than uh, to start with the kitchen renovation, unless the kitchen renovations are what you're looking for, which is totally legit. Uh, developing a firm culture, even if you have one employee. Uh, and uh, for us, we wanted to be the employer that we felt we never had. And, uh, and our first employee, uh, Musin Sadiq, is, uh, is here in the audience. He's still with us. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, um, and it's really about, for example, you know, being this ultra flexible. That, what, that was a thing before COVID, work from home, um, not you know, be more about result or oriented than anything else. And it's really about... Uh, on the personal level on, and on the professional level. So for us, there's no one that is junior in the team. No one is here to assist anyone else 
all of our employees, it was really personally important for me that uh, everyone is going to the city, going to the client, the decision-making process is clear and transparent to them, and I don't need to come back to the office and, you know, tell them what I talked about and forget 20% of that was probably the most important. Um, we do, we, we are, um, we'll, we'll talk about it, about um, what th that we believe in. I can't see anything. Uh, yeah. Um, so, for example, we have uh, our bike tours uh, that we that we do kind of an event. Each of our employee has a bike share membership that we provide because we believe in that type of uh, of a lifestyle. Um, and these are things that were very important for us from the beginning. Um, yeah. Oh, this one is yours. Um, so, know what you don't know. Uh, so. Um, on the one hand, uh, oh, one thing to always know that, uh, especially either if you want to open a practice, start a practice, or to move to uh, to undertake some something in, uh, in uh, while you're already working, um, there will never be a perfect time. Uh, there will be never be there, there will never be a time when you already know everything you need because that's not possible even on the ty technical type of knowledge, but it's definitely not possible to gain the, uh, the experience of running a business uh, without doing that. Uh, that being said, uh, it is critical to know what you don't know, and uh, that would apply even for people who have a lot of experience, and identify where you, you are less uh, skilled, have less uh, expertise, have less uh, knowledge, and there are ways to complement that. There are uh, great resources like uh, courses. Uh, we've done a lot of those, especially on the business side. There is really great uh, uh, wealth of materials uh, available. Uh, we've been building, and I recommend it to you too, to, uh, we've been building a network of, uh, of peers and uh, like related professionals that we can reach out to for advice uh, or to delegate specific specialized wor uh, type of work to them. And on the type of expertise and skills that you need on a more everyday basis, this is where you want to look for uh, hiring people that uh, complement the type of uh, um, experience and skills uh, that you have. So I think many architects would agree that the business education that we received in architecture school, <laughs> you're laughing, yeah, uh, <laughs> is very little. So, I, and I am, I have to admit, I am, I am a totally nerd. I, on every given day, I, I don't watch Netflix, I do watch a lot of online courses about uh, uh, business, running a business, and if anyone is interested, I'm, would be, I would be more than happy to recommend the programs that I would say really changed uh, the, my life and <laughs> my business. Uh, but I think it's uh, really important for you to know that. So, for example, another rule of thumb is that every partner needs to dedicate at least 50% of their time for business development. So once you go anywhere under that, it's either you need to hire someone or there's something wrong in, your, in the way you, you, you carry the work. Um, and it's really, don't ever stop marketing because even if you think that, oh wow, it's, uh, I'm busy and uh, I have lots of work and I don't need, uh, it all comes from referrals. Oh, I love that uh, line when my colleagues tell me that. Um, that's, that's just not good enough and you will just hit a point where it's just dry because you didn't do all that business development and marketing and, um, and all of that. Uh. Which leads me to how to do the marketing part of your business. Uh, and. Um, my mentor told me, you know, education is the best marketing, and I think that architects take for granted how much uh, wealth of knowledge we have that our clients don't have. And oftentimes we even, we, we just, even in our conversation, we use those terms and, and terminology. So this is th your best opportunity to not only position yourself as the expert, but really celebrate it because no one wants a pushy salesperson, you know, shoving, you know, just pushing their, their um, salesy materials. But once you uh, really translate all your knowledge to be more educational based and what we did, um, for example, oh, someone watched it, that's nice. <laughs> um, 
I started with the three minute videos that I just pick a topic that I, someone asked me about it and I just go on camera and I talk, explain it for three minutes. Or the other thing is that the webinars that I, it's not me when I invite guest uh, experts to, uh, to cover topics uh, that you know, other people could, uh, could find interesting. Um, and I had, I had Jan Gell as a guest speaker. Like it's, it's pretty remarkable the people that say it, say yes and have that yes saying yes mentality but uh, the point is is that education is really the best tool for you uh, to share your knowledge and uh, and uh, that is that is our marketing yeah so this is the bonus lesson uh, but uh, really, you know, we, uh, we as a firm and personally, we advocate for uh, kind of comp living in uh, compact uh, urban areas with uh, transit uh, and also for building them, of course, and uh, with a little reliance of cars, on cars. And uh, we also practice that. We, uh, we live, our family lives in a, in a condo in a well-connected area. We don't own a car. We... We go around by uh, foot, by a bike, by, uh, by transit, occasionally by car share. And uh, somehow even uh, our clients who are busy building uh, condos in exactly, for exactly the people who are living in these areas, they're surprised that, uh, uh, that we live that way because there is still some notion that uh, once you have kids, you you grow and you grow up, uh, you move to get, uh, you get a house, you, you get a car and uh, live that uh, kind of life. Uh, but I think if, you, if there's something you believe in, you obviously you will probably uh, implement it in um, all spheres of life. So I encourage you in, uh, in the thing that you identify as your mission or in what you find important to the extent possible also implement it in uh, in your own lives. And uh, I will just mention if you saw those, uh, oh, there are only two left. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, we, uh, everything that we share today uh, is on our website and uh, on that. Um, Colorful uh, gums. You can uh, <laughs> you can scan a, a barcode that will lead you to our website and um, subscribe to our newsletter, where we in the next three days you will get uh, more of the educational content that I covered. So I invite uh, everyone to to do that, or you can scan the this barcode. I don't know if the stretchy presentation will uh, keep that, but anyway, there are a few more. Or just find someone who took all the gums already. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, both uh, Office U and Smart Density, for those uh, fantastic and enlightening presentations. Um, let's start c with the conversation. I guess I'll ask a question and I'll pass off the mic to whoever would like to answer. Um, or you can come up and sit. It, you'll have to stand anyway, so if you would like to come up and sit. I'm scared to move it. Not everyone in the architectural profession get a certificate of practice. What promoted you to start your own firm? Uh, was that always your plan? So. Yeah, funny story. <laughs> yeah, we had to. <laughs> Um, we entered the museum competition in, um, in South Korea for the, in Sejong, the National Museum Complex, before we had a certificate of practice. And we were not expecting to make it to the second phase, but the second phase requirement was that we be an actual legitimate architecture practice. And I got my license the day before it was due. Yeah, I think we, uh, we we always knew we uh, we wanted to uh, 
to start a firm, didn't necessarily know what it would be exactly about, but I definitely knew that. So yeah, so we kind of, uh, we, we were also licensed in Israel, so we're kind of uh, doing that at uh, lightning speed to the extent it was uh, <laughs> possible here. Thank you. Um, outside the realm of design, what are your biggest challenges and most exciting aspects of your work? Well, I'd say the two are pretty different from each other, the, the challenges and the exciting parts. I mean, the challenges can be exciting, but I'd say that the, the exciting part, at least for us, is just how much we get to, to discover about other places, other cultures, um, how much we get to bring some of that into our approach, and how much we get to keep losing our bearings and kind of finding them again in a different setting. And, and, and that also keeps us um, collaborating with a lot of different offices, which have more expertise than we do within local context. And it's a challenge, collaboration internationally, but it's also incredibly rewarding because we just get such a, such a, um, uh, kind of a, almost a personal experience of a place that's, uh, that, that, that is not really our, our home. Yeah. We made friends in <laughs> Korea, in Czech Republic, and it's really great to have friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, it's really seeing the impact that, um, you know, those educational tools, such as the video, the video, it, I get, um, you know, when someone calls me and say, I watched that video, or it could be like, you know, media picks it up very, very well. Uh, like from CBC, I just saw the, the video that you posted about angular planes. We know it as the wedding cake, are you? And, and it's really a way to reach out a wider audience. And for me, it's a challenge how you explain those really complex notions of angular plane, like just try to explain how an angular plane affects a building. And video allows me, those three minute videos allow me to, to do that and seeing the, the impact that I actually you know, made a dent uh, in, 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 in the world through, through educational and explaining the things and concepts is, is, is very rewarding. Uh, I'm subscribed to their newsletter. It's really, <laughs> it's really good. Um, uh, you both have smaller, tight-knit teams. How do you get along professionally and personally? How do you figure out your own work-life balance, especially in the earlier days of practice? Um, it, it is something that we've had to learn over time, and I think the really key thing um, is to learn to respect each other's differences of opinions without getting upset about it. Um, in particular, because when people differ from you, it's very often just temporary. Um, so that's that's been one thing, and the other thing is we, we we try to also practice within our office this approach that it's it's about results. We're not slavish about you have to show up to work at a certain time, um, and uh, I think you know whatever life throws at you, we try to accommodate it as much as possible. Yeah, I think I covered that pretty much in one of the lessons. But uh, and and uh, Musin and Sonia from our team are here, so um, I I can only say the truth. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, for example, uh, I I think it's it's really about being that employer you never had. And you know, Musin was working from home in Morocco, and Nigel was working from home in Victoria, and we worked from home in Israel. All of this, you know, in the past year, and we manage to to run a, a practice and and I think it's really about being ultra flexible but at the same time allow them the professional growth they want and deserve so it's Um, my next question is, has technology changed how you practice architecture? I have, th I have a feeling you've already answered this. How does technology change the way you communicate with clients and potential clients? I can start. So now I'm already mentioned the uh, things that are more uh, like direct um, outreach uh, through video, but um, I think uh, 
I don't know, it's probably less technology than uh, as much as COVID, but I think the change has re been really fundamental, especially that we were a, kind of a young firm at that time. And uh, just the amount of time saved, uh, we were really doing in-person meetings now only on uh, kind of special, special occasions or critical parts of projects, uh, but uh, from work meetings to, uh, to like in a client outreach, it's uh, mostly is, um, by video. Um, I think another aspect is that uh, really, I think in the last five, 10 years, it's probably five, it's become possible to go almost paperless, uh, uh, including not just to like uh, document, documents, but even in a lot of the kind of more type um, hand sketchy work. Uh, and um, it, it kind of, uh, I think it makes things easy, uh, easier in uh, some sense, and also just kind of from uh, thinking about uh, office organization and uh, kind of how much real estate you need to, to do something, it's, um, uh, it's quite significant. Um, and kind of more general, I think, um, uh, in a way, I think for, for in some, maybe in some uh, aspects of, uh, of, of our profession, it's still, uh, it's still there, but I think the uh, getting projects through uh, golfing is to a large extent uh, gone, and, uh, or at least has been replaced by, uh, by kind of, uh, by other means as well. So that's been a kind of tremendous uh, change we think that uh, I think it was for us was uh, really facilitated our uh, our growth. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I was gonna say the same thing. Um, the advent of like online whiteboards and Zoom and various other communication systems has have allowed us to do the collaboration with other offices worldwide. And I'm not sure that it would have been possible to do this in the same extent 10 years ago. Uh, the, the pandemic has really accelerated that, so there was a definite silver, silver lining there. Um, I think the other thing that, it hasn't yet changed our practice, but it's becoming very important, is um, the whole idea of energy modeling in buildings is becoming much more important in the whole pipeline of how you think about a project, because now you have to think about uh, not only a monetary budget, but an energy budget and a carbon budget. And by being able to do the modeling, uh, modeling thermal bridges, modeling you know um, energy losses across a whole assembly, it gives you the confidence and power to make decisions that previously were just guesswork or like just you know optimistic thinking. Um, and I think that this is going to have like a, a really profound impact in the way that we look at buildings, less as formal constructs and more as like organisms with an energy balance and an interior and out exterior that need to somehow be uh, calibrated um, and, you know, living processes. Uh, so that's, that's something that's very exciting for us. Might add something. I'd, I'd say that uh, the ability to really take control of software has also um, kind of come a long way. Um, at the time, we, I mean, maybe even five years ago, 10 years ago, you used to get a software and this is what you get. It's got its features and, and that's, that's all. Um, and I, I think in the last few years, um, uh, it, it's, it's become possible to program your way into softwares and to, to, to really make the tools do, um, do what you want them to do. And Sebastian's learned program. I, you want to talk about it? Sure, I, I mean, I learned programming from SketchUp which is not what I expected. Um, but once I started, I got hooked, and it just went to Blender, went to uh, Rhino, went to other things. It's not for everybody, but if you have a certain type of brain, I really recommend it because just a little bit of it can bring you so much, not only enjoyment, but also a lot of power, and you're no longer just kind of limited with your tools. Uh, yeah, I don't have a programmer brain either. Um, <laughs> what's uh, one piece of advice you would like to pass on to new practices or practitioners? This is also a question I feel that you've had answered. <laughs> uh, what's the one thing you wish you had known right from the start? Um, that uh, it's going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I think that if you would tell me, and, and I, part of the presentation, we wanted to show you our first building that we, that we got after uh, three years, but uh, the interesting part that our second building was already a 30-story tower in the, on top of the Ontario line. So what Misha talked about this, you know, not being the linear process uh, necessarily, I, I think it's really about investing in the right realm that, uh, that you had. And, um, and if anyone told me five years ago that we would already be working on mid-rise buildings, uh, tall buildings, we are now working on a 100-acre uh, master plan near a, a future GO station, I don't think I, I personally would believe that. And uh, someone told me, you know, people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year and underestimate what they accomplish in five or ten years. So it's really about you need to give yourself the, the, the time. It's not going to be like two months and like, ooh, that, that doesn't work. I, I better go find, for, find another job. I think it's really that three-year bl really blow up that, um, that uh, and, and knowing it's going to work eventually. Um, one thing that I, I think has been really important to realize is that although we still feel the imposter syndrome, it isn't a game, a game ender. Um, the thing about architecture is that we have to remember we are generalists. We are not expected to know everything about everything and you can get most of what you need to know is down to research, hard work and common sense. And you know, you, you don't need to be afraid of projects that appear to be out of your reach, um, but you do need to believe in yourself and you need to kind of um, be willing to take that risk. And the other thing I would say is that um, when projects come to an office, they may come from very unexpected directions. They might come all at once, very suddenly. You need to be flexible and you need to be prepared for that um, because otherwise things will pass you by. So jump on the opportunities because there are so many other people willing to as well. Uh, excellent. Um, what do you see as upcoming challenges for newer practices? And I feel like we've also kind of covered this too. How is starting a business now perhaps different than it might have been uh, 15 years ago? Well, we weren't practicing 15 years ago, but uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of things have changed in 15 years. Um, I think first of all, uh, and maybe even just in the last two years, um, what defines an office, or rather a functioning office, is very different than what defined a functioning office uh, even five, six, seven years ago. Um, and that's something that we kind of touched upon earlier. Um, an office can be demater dematerialized. Uh, we don't all need to be in the same place. We can be working from wherever, as long as we are able to deliver what we need to be delivering. And and that's 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 one thing that's I think has has changed a lot. And that's something that takes adjustment because we're not necessarily being uh, either educated to work in in that manner or in a flexible manner like that or. Uh, necessarily aware of how to handle distance um, uh, within a team. And then, I, I mean, I think other than that, I think what's, what's going to impact um, young firms starting now, um, or even firms at older firms, is uh, the notion of, uh, of uh, resilience in, in architecture and sustainability. Um, I mean, sustainability is maybe more limited than resilience, but there are so many more things that we need to integrate within a design process and things that are not limited to the field of architecture. Um, and a lot of the ones that we kind of talked about are related to the field of landscape architecture. And these need to be considered in every project because a project is part of its ecosystem. We can no longer design buildings that are standalone outliers that are not part of their context, that are not part of their environment. And that's something that, that, that's that's probably most, one of the most crucial things for, for an office starting now to take into, cons into consideration. Um, so I think, again, we don't have the experience of starting a firm 15 years ago, but um, I think uh, overall uh, it, is, uh, it is easier today because the, like, just the logistical challenges of uh, setting up an, an office and starting working on a project are just uh, simpler. And when you, know, when you scale up, you don't necessarily, it's not like you have three, uh, three stuff, you have to set up a server uh, right away. And, 
area, rent uh, a lot of space, um, etc. So, uh, and uh, of course, uh, on the outreach uh, part, it's really things that, um, in terms of putting yourself uh, out there, uh, creating uh, the kind of uh, content for which you want to be uh, known, like creating a simple project that uh, exemplifies your. Uh, uh, your approach and uh, being able to spread it, it's really, I think that's become a, like a great opportunity. Uh, I do think that on the other hand, because the competition is much wider, I'm not talking necessarily on the global level because we're not really, like not for uh, every uh, typical uh, small project we're like, we have, we're on a global competition, but de definitely uh, there is much less specialization in terms of uh, geographically, I would know like uh, Scarborough, not really Scarborough firm, like we definitely have uh, firms uh, uh, from um, Kitchener and London working here and uh, vice versa. So, and uh, it's uh, like if you, it's become like critical to specialize uh, in some way. It's uh, it's it's kind of you used to be able to just by uh, limits of geography and the need to know people locally to uh, to just work locally. But it's not really uh, that possible that much now. So you have to have some kind of specialization. I think. Thank you. And my final question, and we'll, if anybody in the audience has any questions, we'll uh, turn to them. But first, uh, why do you think the jury chose you for best emerging practice? What would you tell someone considering entering for the 2024 award cycle? So I just want to admit that we actually competed with them in 2020 and did not win. So maybe I shouldn't give any advice. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think as, as the jury, when the, the criteria is about developing unique uh, marketing materials, have a clear voice, and I think we, with, in our case, it, it is pretty clear. Uh, it's also about for us to show how it actually leads to work and it actually leads to impact, and, uh, and I think that is, uh, that is crucial. And if you are thinking of um, applying for the 2024, um, I think it's uh, it's really about finding your voice, just like I said about finding your secret sauce. And every fr architect friend that talks to me about and thinks about starting their own practice, I go back to that about what is so. What do you do better than any other architect? And uh, once you on that um, hit that road, I think that's uh, that is the most uh, important thing. And also apply for the OEA Shift Award in uh, 2023, uh, and we. Uh, submitted and won the, the OEA Shift Award twice before we uh, received this award. Um, use really big words that nobody <laughs> understands. <laughs> no, but actually, literally what she said. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we completely agree. Like, uh, you do need to have something unique, um, you know, uh, I can't completely speak for the jury, but I think that everybody who applied has something, you know, beyond just we're good designers, we're thoughtful, we detail nicely. That's fine, but architecture has some bigger concerns that need to be addressed somehow, and there, and you have to have a mission. Um, so, you know, uh, awards are great, but I think that your first aim should be not winning the award. There's no formula for it. Work on yourself, work on having, you know, a unique voice and know why you're an architect. I'd just like to add, or licensed technologist, but that's me. <laughs> yeah, and, and yes. Um, uh, so uh, if there's any questions from the audience, I don't know if, wow, quite, cr oh. So the question just for the w w webinar portion is, did you open the, your business before you had a client or after you had a client? Yeah, did you start the firm? Yeah. Um, you might not like my answer because obviously our scenario is unique. Uh, I 
started working, I, we did that game that I showed you. Misha was working full time, not with me. And then at some point I said, either I'm going to hire a senior architect or you're gonna quit your job at the city <laughs> and come join me. And it was, and, and that where COVID started. And I said, okay, don't quit your job <laughs> because we don't know what, if the world is gonna end tomorrow. Uh, and then after a few months I said, I, and actually COVID really accelerated things because I started doing the, the webinars and everything online and then work really started picking up even more. So COVID I don't, it was a good thing. I don't know if that's okay to say, um, but it really accelerated um, things for us. Uh, so that was the point where uh, Misha joined me and I even look back and say that that fear of like is the business going to sustain our family we just had a baby was very very scary and looking at it today when we have you know a much much bigger team even looking at that question is it is I don't know if funny but it's very rewarding to know that today that fear does not exist Maybe there's a recession, so I don't know about that, but. Uh. Yeah, um, yes. Uh, <laughs> so we did have a project, but we also didn't have a project. So it's kind of a <laughs> mixed answer. I think we started the, off well, we entered the, the competition for the, the Korean um, museum complex. And we won, which we did not expect. And at that point, uh, we just quit our jobs and started working on that. At which point, uh, I mean, that also happened the same week I also had a child, which I agree is not good timing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where you kind of have to make a decision at some point of what you're going to focus on and you have to take some risks and we ended up having to find sources of revenue for the first few months while we waited for international projects to pay, which can take a while. So it's, I mean, the timelines are long and you're not getting paid on a monthly basis. So you're, you're waiting for milestones. So we had to really kind of hit the ground and try to get other projects to kind of <laughs> help us in the meantime. Um, but we had to take that risk. And oh, I mean, it, it was more than two months. Oh. I think it was like two years until we got paid. <laughs> Maybe not that much. Well, from the Korean project, right? Like we, we had to find other projects to kind of make, yeah. make ends meet. Yeah. Um. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is there any, there's another question. I guess you'll have to speak up. <laughs> So the question is, what's the secret sauce and what keeps you going? I'm summarizing, but. Um, so the, the secret sauce for us was um, merging architecture and urban planning. And every time with that, you know, problem solving mindset, when I talk to uh, a potential client, I'm able to explain our advantage and knowing that it will be really hard for other architects to you know, compete with that really strong advantage that we bring to the table. And that is, you know, for example, um, w working as a kind of a one-stop shop that does the architecture and the planning. The planning is a tool for us to support our architecture. It's not like we're going to represent anyone at the OLT. That's not the type of planning that we care about, but it's really about making our architecture uh, stronger with the city, understanding, speaking the city's language, speaking the, the public language. Uh, and, uh, and here I gave you my pitch. So, uh, uh, and what keeps me going is really seeing uh, success and the impact that, uh, um, that we were able to, to make through everything that, I, that we basically shared with you um, so far. It's a very similar answer, I guess, because it is merging architecture and landscape architecture, right? which Nikov's presentation uh, dealt about, and it's something we are still kind of working on and developing this methodology. But uh, 
like we felt it was very very productive approaching architectural projects like buildings using landscape architecture methods i mean i, I want to say that this really applies to anything. I mean, architecture doesn't exist in a vacuum, and I think anyone can look outside of the profession for um, not just inspiration, but new ways of thinking and new connections that, that really change the way we perceive the work we do. So, so whether it's urban planning or, land, or landscape architecture, which are fields somewhat adjacent to architecture, it doesn't matter. It could be something far off field that, that, that inspires you in, in, in your practice. So. Sorry, just to add one thing, I, I, I want to add that it's just this one thing that you do better than anyone else. And what the other thing that we said is that smart density could happen in any scale, the small, the medium, and the large. That's why we didn't really narrow down the, the scale. It worked out, and now we, we work on, on any scale. But it's really what is unique for you, and uh, for a long time we... We worked on the missing middle, and uh, even if you Google that, I'm pretty sure my content will come up on the first page of Google. So that was really helpful to get uh, more work. Then we realized that it's really hard to make those projects feasible, so we had to move on. But uh, um, I think that is the answer. What do you do that, any, that you just do better than anyone else? Um, yeah, and, and, and just to answer maybe uh, at least my version of um, what keeps us going, I think that it's actually really exciting to realize these connections between architecture and other fields. Um, every time you see this link, it's, um, it's intellectually stimulating and rewarding, and there's, all, there's you know, these constant discoveries we're making, um, particularly when we're working in other countries um, and we're, we're finding out so much about uh, the history of the site, um, the kind of intellectual history or like the cultural history behind a certain competition. Um, you know, we when we do a, a, a competition for say a monument or a memorial in Korea, we're touching some really, really, you know, sensitive subjects. Um, but learning about that history and, you know, trying to understand like how architecture can actually like speak to people, tell stories, that is rewarding because uh, it's it's not always obvious, um, and uh, I, that's all I have to say. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is there any? Oh, Susan. So, simply put, what's the relationship between awards and quality? And do you think one feeds the other more? <laughs> I mean, that's a hard question to answer because I, I think I want to say that um, quality is only uh, discovered, I mean, the quality is discovered on multiple timescales. Um, not to get esoteric here, but I think the, an, an, an award um, recognizes a certain type uh, of work uh, at a certain time, so maybe a building that's just been open or a firm that's just been created or something that's just been recognized, but I think uh, quality can only really be assessed um, maybe some, uh, sometimes on much longer um, timelines or, t or time scales. And, and I think while an award can can uh, can uh, be a, a judge of, of quality, maybe on a short on a short time scale, we have very few awards that that recognize um, quality on a longer time scale. The weathering of a building, the aging of a building, the the, the actual success of a building, the ad adaptability of it. What's the what's the building that got an award? Um, 20 years ago, doing now, or what's the what's the design? And and I, and I feel like we're maybe missing 
maybe a scales of awards. Um, and and because I do think awards are valuable to recognize quality, but, but maybe they need to be uh, recognizing work on, on, on broader scales and time scales than, than they, they are doing right now. Uh, it might be a little uh, philosophical uh, for us, that question, but um, I think, especially when thinking about through awards for uh, projects or uh, more like specific uh, um, ideas, I, I think there is definitely the issue of, uh, like, first of all, they are eventually you're evaluating a, a representation, but um, I think one of the fundamental issues is that we're kind of setting... Uh, uh, often setting criteria, criteria that are uh, not necessarily consciously uh, evaluating more or uh, um, innovation, which is sometimes for the sake of innovation and uh, um, interest in, uh, or in form uh, or maybe kind of perfecting some kind of um, uh, aesthetic ex expression, which are um, kind of, it's kind of the questions that tend to be uh, interesting to uh, especially to architects, but uh, maybe one of the issues that there isn't enough uh, evaluation or setting of uh, what kind of problem uh, you're set to solve. I mean, okay, you have say architectural competition or something of that uh, of the of that kind, and um, you're looking at uh, there are criteria for the design of the site, but the type of pro of problems. Uh, you're, you manage to, or you, you undertake to solve, I think there uh, can be a, a little un underappreciated aspect. I want to give a very practical and down-to-earth answer to your question in that we work with hyper-practical clients, which are developers, that they have an Excel sheet, their Excel sheet needs to work, and uh, sometimes they are hyper-profit-focused. You know, the, the award, this award helps us to position ourselves as something like, okay, that's okay that you are looking at the bottom line, but what is the double, double, uh, the double bottom line and the triple bottom line? What are the other impacts that you have a, as a developer, whether you want it or not, have on our, the social consequences? And it hel allows me to position the firm as the firm that will give this de the developer that value add, that triple bottom line, that it's not just profit, it's also affordability and sustainability for us. Uh, thank you for those answers. Um, I don't see any other hands. So I'm going to th uh, thank everyone, uh, especially uh, Smart Density and Office U, uh, for uh, sharing uh, their knowledge and passion with us tonight. Um, please feel free to stick around for a few minutes. We'll be here until about nine. Uh, so please go ahead and catch up with each other and chat with our speakers if you didn't get a chance to ask your questions earlier. I'd just like to thank everyone again and enjoy the rest of your evening.